Today, I have a special guest, Kevin Donatelli, who is currently the Vulnerability Remediation Manager at Booz Allen Hamilton. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you so much for lending your time and your expertise and to this conversation. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad to be here. So before we dive into the topic at hand, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background, your journey into security, and how you ended up in, in the field of vulnerability management? Um, well, it's been... Uh... It's been a little bit of a wild ride, but um, it's. I was very fortunate to get started in the cyber field. Um, I think, uh, like a lot of people, some people took a chance on me, and I just kind of took that and ran with it. Um, finally, uh, got my CISSP, and from there, it's just been growing ever since. But I started out um, at the help desk, as I'm sure a lot of people do. And um, then I moved over to cyber, did some um, endpoint management and a little bit of incident management. And then I got into uh, assessments, cyber assessments, specifically with uh, doing the RMF. So following a bunch of NIST standards uh, and then got started with uh, ACAS scans and vulnerability management. And here I am. Here you are. And what, what was there anything in, in particular that that kind of drove you to, your, to the field? It sounds like your career kind of was a stepping stone to where you are today. Um, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's been um, everything's been definitely building, um, even from what I where I started, like I still use that knowledge today. Um, so a little bit, I do a little bit of incident response now, but it's just like on a case by case basis. Um, and I, you know, just keep on carrying those, um, stepping stones and building blocks up until what I'm doing right now. And it's, you know, things are just obviously changing with like new technology. So, um, a lot of times it's just making it easier than what it was before. Right. We're definitely going to talk a little bit about technology and how, um, our lives are, people see the doom and gloom in it, but I think it's going to make our lives a lot easier. So yeah. let's dive right into the topic here. We're talking about standard operating procedures. I know it's not the sexiest of topics, but it's something that if you don't have it in place, it's like a policy. If you don't have it in place, you don't know what you're doing. You can't standardize things. You can't be, you know, all these other things. I want you to, <laughs> to, tell, to tell us about this. But, you know, from a very uh, basic standpoint, um, you know, what is an SOP um, and, and its role in vulnerability management? Uh, short and simple, vulnerability management SOP is a document that outlines the process to manage vulnerabilities. Um, it can uh, it starts with uh, discovery and it can end with uh, remediation or in some cases risk, risk acceptance. Um, that, that's a simple <laughs> just definition of it. Yeah, no, that, no, that's good. And and so how does having this documentation help to improve um, vulnerability management or the program as a whole in an organization? Um, it's definitely essential for really any organization because um, being any kind of any size organization, you need to know what your vulnerabilities are because um, more than likely like you're connected to the Internet and anything that's connected to the Internet, as you know, it's vulnerable. So no matter the size, you like you need to know what you're vulnerable and you need to know um, what your security posture is. Right. And I, and I think um, we had some offline conversations. You actually just got done creating an SOP. Is, is that correct? Yeah, creating it and really refining it. Right. And then so can you can you kind of walk us through what some of the, the first steps are? Um, and creating that for an organization, you know, if someone wants to really try and mature their program versus just pushing a button and hoping things go well. Yeah, so yeah, definitely going that approach, pushing a button, hoping things go well, it's never good. So <laughs> having a well-defined uh, vulnerability management SOP really helps you um, keep track of vulnerabilities. So um, for example, you can do uh, some kind of scanning, like with ACAS, or um, I think Rapid7 is another one. Um, that'll give you what vulnerabilities are on your network. And from there, you need to know what to do with them. So if you've got uh, some engineering folks that do the remediation, 
they obviously know the system more than what I would know. So you can say, for example, you can use a ticketing system and send them a ticket and just put like all the vulnerability information in there and what assets is being affected. And um, from there, you just need to, uh, I guess, if they need to like keep up with them. Um, what I mean by that is they got their own stuff going on. So okay. it and really depends on the criticality on what's defined by the client. So um, having a defined process, it you know, makes it easier on everybody, not just security side, but on the engineering side as well. Gotcha. So let's let's take this one step further and, and actually walk through all of the elements that go into creating the SOP. You know, you mentioned some teams that need to be involved. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the typical roles and responsibilities that are involved in this process? So obviously one role, vulnerability manager is gonna be involved. Um, <clears throat> but depending on your organization, um, you might also have a ISM, Information System Security Manager, and you might also deal with the ISO, Information System Security Officer. Um, in terms of, say, if you're a government agency, uh, you're gonna need to um, get a handle on your vulnerabilities for um, um, an assessment authorization um, submission. So um, those are some roles. And then you might also have like an authorizing official or someone that is that can accept risks if it comes to that. You also, um, they also might accept uh, poems if um, you need to do like a major software upgrade and there's a certain vulnerability that is supported on that operating system. And so obviously with a major upgrade, you're going to want to be careful, um, make sure it doesn't break anything else. Um, and then also engineering teams, um, they can be like Splunk engineers, um, like infrastructure, like so many different teams, like it really depends on what the vulnerability is. So you can send it to that specific team. Right. And, and you know, you, you made a, a good point earlier where you're talking about, you know, you, you hand off some a vulnerability to a remediation team um, and there's a lot of coordinating that needs to go into there. Um, how what do you put into your SOP or your documentation to ensure that these other roles, these remediation teams are actually pushing that work forward? Um, definitely take advantage of a, a ticketing system, um, and that way you can incorporate a due date. So once you have, um, each security level, um, remediation timeline defined, so like criticals needs to be done in like 14 days, highs, 30 days, so on and so forth. You can put the due date in there. And if, um, your organization has like a, um, like a planning session of upcoming upcoming tickets and um, what what kind of level of effort we're going to have to have for these tickets, um, they can kind of work around it, like work that into their system. And obviously, if there's critical ones that really need to be patched, then that's going to probably going to require more hands-on uh, work with the engineering team. Like, hey, like what's, what's the status of this? Like, where are we at with this? Like. Like, um, especially if it's a exploitable uh, vulnerability that's um, like it's known, that's really going to need some more hands on. Right. So it, it, being persistent is really what it seems like. But having those processes in place that say, OK, mm -hmm. well, every three days you get a follow up. If it's a critical every, you know, X hours, we need a status update, Th things like mm -hmm. that you would include in that SOP. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, and it's really once you have a, like a well-defined SOP, once you start working with all the other engineering teams, like any other teams that are involved, you can start to build that relationship with them. So uh, you can kind of get them on a, I guess, a little bit of a more personal level, like, hey, what works for them? What works for this person? And that, this and that. Um, and that way you're not just the, the security person coming in and like, hey, we need to do this. Like, you can creating friction, right? Yeah. Right, right. 
because you know we all have stuff to do we're all really busy and you know just having that um professional working relationship with your entire team that definitely helps right and i was talking um to clement forqua uh, he's the vulnerability management lead at elastic um and he was talking about finding shared goals and understanding their challenges, like like you were just saying, everyone's got their day job, finding shared goals and objectives um, and aligning with that. And that's gonna help you actually get things done um, faster, better and smarter. Yep. So let's take a step back here. When we're when we're taking a look at the SOP as a, as a, to as a whole, you know, you've got a blank sheet of paper or your, your Word document, whatever. Um, what, what are, you know, how do you determine the scope and the objectives of, of that SOP? Like putting the vision down from a blank slate. So defining the scope, um, it's it might d vary between uh, client to client. So if you're a um, government agency, then you're already going to have things that are defined. So you're going to have like uh, the governing agencies requirements uh, overarching, and then you have like the the national standard, like NIST standards, and this, that, and the other. So in that case, most of the work is already done, but if you're uh, not a government agency, you're it, it's really up to the client itself and what they want to uh, do with these vulnerabilities, pretty much. Um, no, they might go more with uh, best practices. They still might go with national standards, um, but it really does depend on what the client wants and really what their um, level of um level of risk that they want to accept so um if they can have this, this amount of criticals this amount of highs then that's what they'll start with okay and you know you, you've mentioned criticality severity um exploitability of these um when you're writing out this sop you know what steps or procedures do you have around classifying and prioritizing which vulnerabilities should actually be remediated? Well, again, if you're a government, government agency, then more than like that's already going to be defined. Um, right. I found that it a lot of times it's they just follow best practices. So criticals, uh, two weeks, uh, some cases, uh, two weeks to come up with a plan and then actually remediate it within 30 days. Um, highs can be 30 days, uh, and then mediums, uh, like 180. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it really does depend on, again, government or the, the agency organization and what they want. Okay. That, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I had a, uh, another good conversation with, uh, Joshua Copeland. Um, he's the director of cybersecurity at at and And he, he was talking about how a lot of these government agencies, they, they can afford to own their supply chain. Um, mm -hmm. They're able to dictate down to their vendors, this is what you should and shouldn't do, you know, CMMC, et cetera. Um, but for like an, a small business, um, you know, how, how could they approach, you know, building out an SOP if, if they're not necessarily needing to adhere to a framework as stringent as, as NIST might be? Um, again, I think it comes down to what their uh, level of acceptable risk um, is that what they can tolerate. Um, I would say um, any organization, no matter small or big, they would need to go through a risk analysis. Uh, so take into account their entire infrastructure and um, some of the like common uh, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, maybe like a WASP top 10. Uh, if one of those hit the organization, uh, how long can they be down? And what kind of um, it would kind of work in hand with the disaster recovery plan? Like, um, what would that mean for the organization if one of these vulnerabilities or one of these attacks hit? Right. Okay, that makes sense. And then having your response plan to that. Um, okay, that that makes a lot of sense. And and then. You know, we so let's let's take a step back here. We've talked about all the different roles that are involved, the responsibilities of teams, how we can get those teams to actually take action. 
Um, we've talked about, you know, from you know, blank slate, you know, how do you actually create this documentation in a way that's going to be effective? So now tooling is another aspect of this. Um, this scanning, maybe you have a, a risk-based remediation platform, maybe you have an auto patching platform. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about uh, how you would define um, procedures around these tool sets from, you know, and, and, and I don't know if it, You've, if you've already selected a tool at this point and then you're just implementing it in your SOP or maybe the SOP also incorporates, you know, this is what the tool should should include and, and everything. But what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I would say once you have, once you define this timeline, uh, perseverity level of what each one should be remediated, um, the client should also uh, decide what their, uh, I guess, what their other needs are. So, um, one thing that can happen is a like a presentation of different uh, tools that can be used, like scanning tools. And obviously, like a lot of them are going to have the same end result, but some they incorporate their own metrics, uh, own little uh, features. So it's really down to what the client wants. And um, then from there, it's like, OK, what's in the budget? Can they uh, do um, this scanning tool? How many licenses? Um, and then um, <clears throat> just had a thought just escaped me. <laughs> um, <laughs> it will come back. Yeah. OK. Yeah, no, I, if it comes back, just interrupt and uh, interrupt me and we can get back to it. Um, so then on the reporting side of things, and, and I'm not just talking about we've done a, a scan, we have an assessment, and we're handing it over as like a report. I'm talking about you've already done their mediation efforts. You know, you're talking to maybe leadership, executive level. What do you, you put in place in your SOPs to be able to speak that language to them to can not to convince them, but to to let them know that things are going in the right direction to give them better visibility into maybe business units? Like, how, how do you incorporate that into your SOPs? Um, I don't know if it's certain incorporation into the SOP. It's, um, it's it can just be a simple language as um, like a, a weekly report will be sent to leadership, um, and just the reports. Leadership more than likely is not going to know or want to know the specifics of how we do the vulnerability management. What they're more concerned is with is um, what, how are we in a security posture way? So what I mean by that is, um, what does our system look like, or what does our organization look like um, as far as what is our attack surface area? So, and honestly, if you put like a vulnerability vulnerability um, trend picture graph um they'll see like okay let's we're trending down that's good like uh we're having fewer vulnerabilities that's good awesome keep up the good work if they see like a spike then it's like okay what's going on in here and from there um the vulnerability manager might they'll try to be that liaison between technical and non-technical um, that's another common role that's helped me throughout my career is be that in between because uh, not everybody is um, technical. So being that liaison between um, a certain vulnerability where, uh, for example, if there's a vulnerability that can't be remediated um, because there needs to be a major OS upgrade, that's going to like the leadership is going to want to know about that. So um you can um have like a brief summary uh like a powerpoint presentation and then you can have the engineer on standby if the leadership um they want to know more about it so i would say it's just more of just some language within the sop like 
uh, maybe like on a recurring basis of when leadership will be briefed. Uh, and it's really up to leadership and what they want as well. That's such a good point. Um, being able to talk the the business language and I, I think that gets back to understanding the challenges and objectives of, you know, like an engineer, right? Patching something. It's the same thing mm -hmm. as, you know, executive leadership. They have they have to answer to someone too and they have to be able to to speak that language. Um I I think it was maybe three years or four years ago, I, I went to uh, B-Sides in Washington, D.C., and they had a talk just on that. And I tell you, that room was packed. And there was a lot of other presentations that were going on at that time that were interesting. But it seemed like that was like one of the critical things that people just wanted to bridge. Like, how do I I know that a fire is happening? How do I convince the person that this fire is real and that it needs mm -hmm. to be put out? Um, so very important there. So that that that's a lot of really good information. Um, one one last question that I had uh, around developing um, these SOPs is how do you how do you integrate this SOP into other information security document documents that you might have or other SOPs or does it even make sense to do that? Um, I would say the only correlation would be. Um, maybe some annual cyber awareness training because obviously like um, your employees are your uh, greatest vulnerability. Uh, like, you know, you've seen those memes with like a knight and all this armor and it's like, we got firewalls and endpoint security and then just have an arrow going right into their, like right, just, just very small uh, window. So having, um, a like annual training requirements. Uh, I think just be like basic. Uh, hey, if it looks, if this email looks suspicious, don't click on it. Um, that I would say that's really um, one of the other major um, security uh, aspects that you would need to incorporate into the vulnerability management because. I mean, it is a vulnerability. Like, there's always a chance that someone could click on an email and then someone could get in your organization. Right. Doesn't matter how many millions of dollars you've spent on security. Um, do you find in that those annual awareness trainings are sufficient? And and in a lot of cases, they're self-guided quizzes. Um, I mean, is that is that enough? um yes and no um it really depends i mean it really depends on the person i think and obviously of course throughout the whole like starting the uh, security um how much security do you want to have you want to have just enough and then you also want it to be easy enough for your employees or your organization to do their job. If you make it so that it's really difficult for them to do the job, then they're gonna find ways around your security uh, measures. Um, so it really does depend, I think, uh, on the individual. Um, and that's, I mean, yeah, that's, I feel like that's a whole like another area. It, yeah, yeah, like, no, it is. And, um, but it's it, there's so many like chance like not everybody understands um, how the internet works like my parents like I'm always like helping them out with like IT this and that and it's like they ask me a question and it's like no that's not the way it's done right now so right. Um, you might need to uh, know who your employees are and then kind of come up with like specific training courses for, I guess, their level of technical aptitude, so. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, that's something that we've started to do uh, at PurpleSec is like uh, trying to get people to think like an attacker. Like, what mm -hmm. would, how would you create a scenario? How would you do it? And you get them in a mindset. So, that, I mean, that, that's, that's it's really good. I mean, it's, it's, you know, vulnerabilities are more than just a software um that needs to be updated so now are, are, was there anything else that came to mind around creating a, a an sop um through your experience that we might have uh missed 
Um, so I'm looking at my notes right here. Um, I would say, very simply put, you want to define something that works and kind of talked about it already. What I mean by that is you want a process that works well with everybody in your organization. So it works well between all the different teams. Um, and then furthermore, it uh, doesn't have to be noted in the SOP. You want to kind of build that relationship with your other teams. So again, you don't want to be like that security person comes in guns blazing, like, hey, like we need to do this, like, and start freaking out. It's like find out what it is, who we need to talk to, and come up with a plan first. Um, and the better the process works between all the teams, and like the less friction there is, the I mean, the better things are going to get remediated and uh, dealt with um, going forward. Now that's that's the ideal state, right? Um, in, in, an, in a utopian society, you know, all vulnerabilities are, you know, you have a zero backlog, everything that could be exploited, you know, all these things. So, and, and that's a good segue because I, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the challenges or maybe some of the pitfalls that come in place when you're creating these SOPs. Um, so in, in your experience, what challenges have you encountered um, when creating these SOPs? I would see one of the major um challenges that I've had was um, other teams buy-in for process. So I created a draft um, of the remediation process and sent it out to the teams and didn't get much feedback. And um, I kind of pinged them on the side and like, hey, what did you think about this? And it was like this, this, and this. And it's like, Again, it was because they had their own job to do. So it was like, it was kind of like I was adding another task for them to do. Um, but obviously, vulnerability management is something that needs to be done. So I had to kind of work with them a little more, like kind of one on one, and figure out what would be a good process um, that they would be okay with. Um, so just making sure uh, everybody's on the same page as you. Um, that's because we all have our own little processes of doing our jobs. And then like you have someone else coming in and adding something else. It's like, w wait a minute, like, what are you doing? So I would say that's that's been my biggest challenge. OK, and and so how, how do you prepare for a conversation like that? So it's easy to say we need to get uh, you know, on a call and we need to do this. And, and, and I'm sure you've been on a ton of Zoom calls where uh, a meeting is called for whatever case, but there's no agenda. And it's just like, all right, guys, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to talk about this and it's unstructured and you really don't get a lot of value from that conversation. So how do you approach getting that buy-in? Like, are there any techniques that you that you leverage to, to, to gain that? I don't really think there's any techniques. It's just talking with the individual team or the lead of the team and just just having a conversation with them. Like, look, we this is something that needs to get done. Um, how can we incorporate this into your procedures? Um, if it's a matter of um, they need more personnel, then Obviously, something like that would need to be escalated up to leadership. Like, hey, do we have the money to hire uh, another person? Um, if the other team member is just 100% pushing back at all and you're not getting anywhere, then you might want to bring that up with your leadership and then just kind of escalate it a little more. Um, so it, I think it really is on a... I guess, case by case basis. And sure. once you get um, individual team buy in, then you can create another meeting for everybody, uh, including your leadership and other leadership and be like, hey, this is what we have so far. What's everybody's input? And then just kind of go from there. That makes a lot of sense escalating it. Um, obviously, it's not 
the first path that you want to take if you can avoid it, but it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, thanks for sharing, sharing that. Uh, I think that's helpful. Um, so moving forward here, I want to talk a little bit about the role of AI and automation in the vulnerability management um, process. And, and and maybe it ties into SOPs a little bit, but I, I'm curious, are, are you at your organization, are you leveraging AI platforms or ML platforms uh, and automation to, to do your job better? Uh, personally, I'm not, not on my projects. Um, but just like I'm talking with you a little bit before, um, <clears throat> the, the bane of my existence is Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> So from what you've told me, um, automation helps um, remove that Excel spreadsheets and just kind of automates everything. So um, my my hopes and dreams, if you will, is to get started with that automation. Yeah, I mean, I, I've i talked to a lot of people recently and it, and it seems like that's kind of where things are going. and And if, if you look at the different technologies that are coming out, there's a lot of automated risk-based vulnerability management platforms um, that are going, that are providing that, that risk assessment, um, you know, can configure it and tune it and do all the things that you want to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the goal is to get you out of those spreadsheets so that you can spend more time figuring out how you can get buy-in from leadership or improving visibility and detection of vulnerabilities across your, your environment. Um, I think, you know, from my my experience and, and from some of my, my team members, it's it's really just getting you out of that tedious workflow. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's where we see it helping to not replace, but enhance someone's ability to be more secure. Um, and from our, our standpoint, um, we like to say that we do things smarter faster and better, um, mm. meaning that we're we're only focusing on the vulnerabilities that, you know, typically it's more on the how exploitable is that vulnerability, um, because you and I both know that you can chain low vulnerabilities together and compromise the network. Mm. Um, so it helps do that. Um, and, and to your point, you know, ticketing workflows, you know, it's push up a button and it's done. If you have accepted risk, you can choose what you want to accept and whatnot. Um, so it it's definitely worth looking into um, to help make your life easier um, if possible. And and so one other question that I have um, because I've seen I'm, I'm sure you've you've seen all of the posts about GPT, Chat GPT, right? All mm. all, like, all of the things that are happening in there. And um, one one of the first things that I saw uh, security professionals using that for um, <laughs> was to write malicious payloads. <laughs> like, it's, I don't I don't know what it is about about that, but um, but it, it got me thinking. Like, there's all this doom and gloom around. Oh, the bad guys are going to use AI, and this is like here, here's the secret. They've been doing it for the last ten years. Like mm -hmm. this isn't super new. Like GPT is new, but they've been using automation and all these techniques. So, just based off of what we've talked about, how how do you see technologies like ChatGPT or you know other platforms similar to it helping to uh, enhance blue team activities? Um, I would say one thing that, um, could be used for is, um, trying to figure out how to work a, uh, like a certain application or a piece of software. So for example, if like, I'm not too familiar with Microsoft access and, um, for some other tasks, I've, you know, got on there like, hey, how can I do this? How do I do this? And it, I mean, it literally spits out like bullet points, like one, two, three, four, like you do this. So um, it might, I would say that's that's the biggest thing or biggest advantage that how it can help blue teams. Um, obviously it depends on what kind of information you're working on. You, you don't want to put all your organizational information into uh, <laughs> a random website 
Um, but you can still be kind of general on like how, if it's like a, like a COTS software, um, like, hey, how do I do this within this or something like that? That's that's really interesting because that's that that's what forms. I mean, that's the value of a form, right? Yeah. Um, at least, uh, you know, my little bit of my background is in IT. And if you don't know how to do something, you Google it. And nine times yeah. out of 10, you're on like Spiceworks or something. You're just reading through forms. Wow. That's yeah, yeah that's really interesting. So it's helping um, do that information gathering faster. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned about the sensitive data bit because I think G chat GPT just got banned in Italy mm. for uh, violating GDPR laws um, and collecting sensitive data because people are just putting, you know, people put their world, their lives on the Internet and they don't think about it. Mm -hmm. So really good points there. Um, yeah. One last question I have um, before we end it is, uh, do you have any advice for someone who's looking to become a vulnerability management professional? Um, definitely be open-minded and, um, like I would say stay calm, <laughs> um, because, um, especially if you, um, if there's like, uh, some new assets coming onto the network and obviously like initial scans are going to be like so many critical, so many highs, like, cause it's a new system coming online just look through them and um, know that it's to be expected for an initial scan and know that, you know, you still have time and more than likely it's something that's already been fixed on an existing system. So it's just a matter of going in and doing a quick patch or quick update because you know it already works in your environment. And kind of once you realize that, Keep that calm level headedness with your leadership, because if you, when you brief leadership, they're going to see all these new vulnerabilities all of a sudden, and even they might start freaking out. And it's like, let's, let's, let's uh, bring it in for a little bit and just talk about this and just kind of explain to them, hey, this is this is a situation I've already talked with uh, engineering and they're um, they're going to start working on this within the next day or two. Next time we scan, we'll be fine. Um, so that's the uh, kind of staying calm and level headedness. Um, being open minded is working with the other teams. So kind of going back to um, getting their buy in for uh, the process. Um, keep in mind what they have to do. Like, again, they have their own job. They have their own stuff to do. So try to work with them as best as you can and um kind of re like relate to them so to speak um like and because we're on the same side let's we need to work together and just try to find a solution that works best for everybody that's such great advice keep calm um there's a stat floating around there that i think only about one percent of vulnerabilities out there are exploitable mm -hmm. i don't know how true that number is but it, 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 even if it were 5%, it, it still gives you that sense of, okay, well, like you said, taper the expectations and, and calm down. So that, that's really great advice. Mm -hmm. um, well, Kevin, I really, really appreciate your time. This has been super valuable for me. I learned so much. Um, before we end uh, this episode, do you have any other thoughts uh, that you'd like to share? Um, no, I don't think so. Nothing regarding this, but um, definitely appreciate the chance to um, talk about this. All right. Thank you so much.